So um, I'm David Hughes. Uh, a little about myself. Uh, senior, I'm senior red team analyst for General Motors, and uh, one of two people on the red team at General Motors right now. So we're busy. <laughs> uh, Austin, Austin president. Uh, this is my last year, and I'm um, looking forward to handing it off and, and helping in other ways uh, this next year. Husband, father of three, two of my children are here on the front row. Um, my son will be here later. He's nine years old. He's an autistic boy named Ian, and he likes riding the bull. So we'll see if he can <laughs> ride the bull today. Um, at, this is weird about me. I'm studying New Testament Greek and slowly pursuing an MDiv uh, degree. Well, maybe on May D I'll have it. And I do some Blender 3D stuff for fun. Um, so. That's kind of my, one of my hobbies, so uh, um, you might see some of that with the, when we do the videos and have these produced at the beginning of the videos. I did a little video for that, so. Uh, I'm also 46 years old. <laughs> this is the way I feel at hacker conferences. And, um, I don't really have a handle, and it's too late for me to have one now, I understand, you know. I'd actually have been suggesting handles, but they all have the word old in front of them, fill in the blank. <laughs> Fart, fogey, you name it. Uh, but if you have to listen to me, because you have to get on my lawn if you don't. Uh, why this presentation? And, and by the way, the name change, I understand that. Um, it started off as a pen testing uh, uh, course about pen testing hacker sk uh, organiz organizational skills. Kind of dull, actually. And I have some of that in here. But I, I wanted to t think about the things that, when I go to courses that teach pen testing, and I've been to a couple, uh, in my life, the things that you don't get taught that we as pen testers are fairly bad about. We're not the most organized people in the world. Uh, we're not the most, or, uh, we're not the most uh, I guess you could say, we don't really follow, follow uh, 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 I guess you could say, standards very well. You know, I mean, uh, bulleted items exactly. We, we, like to, we like to be creative and, and, and move around a little bit, um, which is, can, can be a good thing. I'll talk about that later. But, but basically, I wanted to, to provide some advice, and a lot of which is based on mistakes that I've made and continue to make sometimes. Um, and you, get, you don't get the stuff in, in usually in the courses that you take on pen testing. <clears throat> also, computers are hard. I mean, they really are, really. Um, and for, this is also for those of you who are considering a career in InfoSec, right? I um, have a brother who is a medical doctor, brother-in-law, I'm sorry, brother-in-law, and I had a conversation with him about our careers, and I said, you know, I don't have the, I don't have the, I don't have what you, what you have to become a doctor, right? I'm probably not as smart, I don't have the discipline, uh, I don't have what it takes to go through all that to become a doctor. So it's not, it would be, it would be easy, but however, at least in medicine, you have some things that are the same today that they were 100 years ago. No doctor's doing an operation goes, whoa, what is that? <laughs> Looks like we have a new bone, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, Grey's Anatomy, right? Either that book's what, 200 years old or something like that? And it's, th it's still the same. I mean, it's still the same. We know more things about the skeleton, about what's comprised of, but it still looks the same and you have the same bones. And, and there's a lot of things that um, are, are standard in medicine. I know they make developments in medicine, but it's... We don't really have much of that in InfoSec. Let me ask you a question. The books on your shelf, how many of you ha own InfoSec books? Raise your hand, right? How many of you are still referencing the same InfoSec books that you referenced five years ago now? Which ones? Like cryptography. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> biographies, yeah, that's cool. Cryptography, that's standard. Biographies, uh, some programming languages, but you know, if you read like the, the Hacking Exposed books, for example, their shelf of like a, is like, like what, two years, for example? I mean, it doesn't last long. Um, so we have moving targets. I mean, the, the, t the tactics the bad guys use, the things they're attacking are changing, the way they attack them are changing, and we are always having to study and learn and learn new things, and it's a constant, constantly moving target. And we, though, however, we often make things harder on ourselves than they should be, and I'm gonna talk about that for the man of this presentation. For those considering career spin tester, you're going to be a jack of all trades. You're going to be doing things like, you're going to have to learn web application stuff one day, and then the next day you'll be doing some kind of physical testing for a client, or wireless, right? So you might not get great at one thing, 
but you're gonna have to get somewhat good at a lot of things to do this. And yeah, I, I kind of sometimes feel like he does. I have a lot of animated gifts, by the way. So if you like my presentation, just kind of you know tune me out, and you can laugh at the, at the picture. Oops, dang it. Hopefully there'll be something in this presentation you might find useful. Hopefully each of you will come away with something, one thing at least, that you'll find useful. Uh, I'm offering some advice, tips, uh, kind of in a random kind of way, in a way. It's, it's, it's things from here and there, but brought together, they'll help you uh, in a pen test. And um, I don't know everything, and I've forgotten much of the rest. So if, while I'm doing this test, and I'm, I'm, this prep test, this, pre, this presentation, if you, if you have a, you thinking, I, I offer some tip and you think of something better than that, raise your hand and you know, let me know. Because some of you know more than I do on, on some, some of these things. And I, I don't pretend to be an expert on everything, so uh, please shout it out. So. And especially if it gets quiet because my, my computer's frozen or something. And I say, are there any questions? I really need questions. It's really any questions. Okay, most of my examples are based in Linux. That's what I use as, uh, primarily as my workstation when I do pen testing. Uh, I'm not against doing using Windows, but there's just so many good tools for Linux to do pen testing with, and I haven't had a need, with the exception of a few things, to use Windows much for that. Now, obviously, you need Windows to test Windows vulnerabilities and that sort of thing, but uh, from just the launch standpoint of the pen test, I start with Linux. Um, it's not a very technical talk. It's just some basics, and some of which you're gonna go, yeah, do we need to hear that? And some of you are going to go, oh, kind of cool, hopefully. I'm actually targeting two, two, two different kinds of people. People new or considering pen testing, people who've been doing it a long time and have bad habits, like me, for example. Um, the old dog, new tricks kind of thing is, is definitely applicable here. Lastly, if you think this presentation is lame, tune me out and enjoy the funny animated GIFs. And so begins my advice, tips, ramblings to make your life easier as a penetration tester. How many of you are penetration testers in here? Anybody? Some of you? Okay, a few. How many of you think about, are thinking about doing it? Raise your hand if you aren't. Yeah, you did. It's crazy. <laughs> You're nuts. First, the tip I want to offer is know, <laughs> know your scope. I love this one. Um, I think he's trying to break through the ice. Whoops. And uh, failed to do so. Um, uh, we often have, when we approach a client or a client approaches us, we often have a very loose knowledge of the scope, right? Um, we're trying to approach this from the idea of being an attacker, and sometimes they want us to be completely what they call black box testing. We don't know anything, right? Because uh, an attacker wouldn't know anything coming in, so you shouldn't either. Well, we can't do that. We can't just start scanning IP addresses everywhere looking for your IP address. So we have to have some knowledge coming in usually. Um, but the client is often wrong about their own network. Twice at least, this is earlier on, and now I hopefully know better. I was told by clients, here's our range. All of our hosts are on this range. Okay, cool. Run off and you know, do the scans. So you got like 50 hosts. Oh no, three. <laughs> so I found this and this and this and you know this. Oh no, that's not ours. But this is your IP range. Yeah, we're in there somewhere. <laughs> my fault, my fault, you know, my fault. I should have been more specific. So I'm scanning some other people's systems and looking for vulnerabilities and yeah. So Sorry? So know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I haven't had to account for that at any point in my life yet, but you know. I did hopefully it didn't go beyond scanning. I didn't start actually, you know, that'd been bad. Yeah, can we get an agreement with you guys because I've already done things and <laughs> well, like we'll do it for free, you know. It's like finding someone's mail and having to go, oh, I'm sorry, I got your mail. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And I know people, there were people that were actually, uh, and, and they got busted for this, uh, but they were actually going out and sniffing uh, uh, insecure wireless networks and approaching the people saying, yeah, here's your key. We were able to break it into it and use it, you know. Uh, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. Um, so uh, scope creep, you know what scope creep, scope creep is, right? So you're doing a, a project of any kind, and what, you're, what you've agreed to do suddenly becomes broader, right? Um, that's usually the client's fault. But you need to be clear when you, when you set up an engagement what it is you're expected to do and stop there. And you know what? There's a the term called, the, you ever heard of the term lanyap? Anybody hear that term? It's a Cajun term. I know there's a lot of Cajun hackers, right? Um, <laughs> that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? The Cajun hacker community, that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so lanyap means giving somebody a little something extra. 
So, you know, if you want to give them extra stuff, you know, that's fine. Um, throw something at them, kind of keep them as your client, you know, but uh, keep them in the scope. Uh, they'll want you to do X, Y, and Z on top of what you're already doing. And so, they'll want to, for example, they want you to uh, offer remediation for what you found when that's not really in scope necessarily. And it's fine to give advice, but if you're giving, that's fine, but they, they want to add clue that in the project, you know, then don't let them uh, creep your scope. Uh, know the environment, and a lot of times you're working off-site at a client site, and uh, don't assume you'll have internet rem at remote sites, or if you have it, now they'll tell you that, oh yeah, you have internet, and you find out, well, it's behind a proxy. It's our internet, right? So you get to your, you get to your location, you need to update your tools, which is, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, it's a bad thing to do anyway, uh, and you can't because everything's proxied. Um, and also, if you're using something like Zap or, or Rip Suite, uh, is, is it set up to work through a proxy? Do you, have, do you know the information is to work through a proxy or not? Um, if not, that's something that's gonna slow you down quite a bit. And also prepare for disasters. We'll talk about that, talk about that later. Uh, we have actually a disaster recovery portion of this, of this uh, talk, so. Any questions about that or comments? Yeah, kinda, kinda you know. Uh, prepare your tools. Yeah, I gotta show this for a second. It's kinda funny. He's got a broom, he's trying to hit fruit with it. That's funny. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe Fruit Ninja's based on this. So they got the inspiration for it. Uh, update everything before the engagement. Uh, don't wait to the client's site to start updating tools. You might not be able to, so it's gonna slow you down. And also, test your stuff after you've updated it. There's nothing worse than getting on site and realizing that thing works. Right? I can remember doing an engagement, and I had all these really cool uh, Ruby and Python scripts I had put together to, you know, and I had rebuilt my system recently, just because I wanted a new, you know, new clean system, and I hadn't installed Ruby, <laughs> which is a problem for Ruby scripts. It needs Ruby. Python's there pretty much, but Ruby needs Ruby script. You know, it's a, it's a dependency for Ruby scripts to have Ruby installed. And then, of course, you have all the other the modules and things that you need to check. So. You know, check your stuff. Uh, don't do major system updates before engagement. Imagine, as a matter of fact, wait way before engagement to do it. Uh, check your licenses too for your stuff. If you're using Burp Suite, what if it expires like in the middle of your uh, middle of your engagement? Now you probably you know renew it and stuff, but still, it's going to know when that expires, so you'll you know you can you can have that ready to, to update. Um, <coughs> Burp Suite's one of the few tools I actually purchase for pen testing, but uh, it's worth it by the way. Okay, I'll pause for the video. Oh. <laughs> uh, more tool tips. Rehearse. Uh, that sounds kind of funny, but walk through the scenarios with your tools. Well, actually, actually work with them before you go on site. Um, it's easy to set up test networks and set up uh, just testing environments where you can, we can practice with your tools. Um, this is especially true with like, uh, social engineering, like if you're using set or you're setting up a, you know, a phishing site, you want to make sure that site works and looks proper because frankly you only get one shot at that probably. You can't send a mass email out to the client's email addresses and then have it not work and say, oh sorry, the phishing site, try this one instead. You know, they're going to be onto it at that point, I think. So uh, make sure it's working. Automate as much as possible through scripts. Um, that way you have some standardization. Uh, if you're using a script to run certain things, then every time you run it, it'll run the same way. Um, you won't have weird variances in output and, uh, and other irregularities. It's a funny one. I'm glad animated gifts work here. I was kind of surprised it did. But. Okay, another little tip. This is a little tiny tip. Um, title your terminals. How many of you have more than five terminals open at a given time, on a, like a pen test, or even when you're working normally? How many of you forget what's running on the terminal sometimes? This is important, well, I'm gonna raise my hand already just to get the shy people out. How many of you have closed a terminal screen not knowing what it was and lost data or output or were having to start something all over again? Yeah, me here. I, I, was, I was actually uh, cracking a password hash and I think I was using the Rocky password list, a big long one, and I was about three hours into it and um, I thought it was the screen, I clicked on it, closed it, and I had to start all over again. You know? uh, actually, I take that back. It was, one of these, it was one of the tools that you can actually start off where you left off. I think it was maybe, maybe Hydra. No, no, it was, it was John the Ripper. So I had to start all over again, I think. 
But anyway, I lost some work. So you can actually, uh, I'll just show you this. You can actually, you may not know this, you may. Um, in most Linux distros, you can actually, there's your terminal. Notice it says terminal up there. You can actually do a terminal, set title, and call it. Don't close me Yeah, there you go, yeah. Yeah, you can call it leave open or something. Uh, or call it inmap or something. And, and you can, um, if I can type. And there you go, you have inmap at the top of the screen. You can call it inmap and then have the ranger running on so you know which is which. A little thing that has saved me some grief when I, when I started doing this. Um, it's not, a, it's not a huge... Just take your light here. Oh, is it clanking? Yeah, it's Yeah, I think it's great. I had two badges on. It's like a cowbell walking around clank, clank. <laughs> get this off here. See, so you get this off, I have to step through it. And it's like a contortionist thing here. It's going to sound good in the video, isn't it? All right. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to get rid of that in post, so... Action, all right. Yeah. Um, all right, so you can, you, can, you can change the terminal title and it keeps you, keeps you organized while you're working. Uh, let's see, next one, uh, file naming tips. This is also something I really fail at because I'll have, I'll, after an engagement of doing all these different things like Nmap and, and doing Derby or whatever, I'll have this incredibly huge pile of files in one folder and sometimes I don't know which is which. Output.txt, what is that, you know? Uh, Inmap.txt, okay, well it's Inmap, that narrows it down to one out of 50 IP addresses. Um, so come up with a convention where you know, for example, I, I'll do like Inmap dash, and then I'll have something that will identify the IP address. Maybe I'll identify what kind of scan it was, TCP rather than UDP, and then that way, when you're doing reporting, this is really cool to be able to, to, it'll slow you down if you don't do it this way. I mean, if you don't have some way of identifying files, reporting is even worse than it is, which is, you don't think it can be, but it can. <laughs> Create a folder structure as well that, that's logical and makes sense. Um, data collecting, it's very important. We do a lot of data collecting when we do pen testing. Um, everything from the initial, um, uh, when we're doing rec reconnaissance to screenshots, my favorite tool uh, of recent discovery is, uh, anybody use NoCase Pro or heard of it? It's not a free tool. Uh, there's a free version. I wouldn't pay for the full thing because I would like it enough that it was worth it to me to buy it and to have every version and every, every platform for a lifetime. But also, I, you, you want to give money to projects that actually work sometimes. You want to help them out. NoCase Pro, I'm going to show you this, is a tool that um, And you know, you can play around with the, uh, this is from my OSCP lab. I think it's kind of up here. There we go, no case bro. So I actually came into this because I was really frustrated with screenshots and what to do with them. Uh, keep them as files, put them in a Word document. If you notice that Word, the newer Word, we put screenshots in, it, it reduces the size down where you can't read what's on the screen. Uh, it, you can't read the data. Uh, this actually allows you to create a hierarchical uh, set of notes here. And what I did here was I, I, I by the IP address octet, the last octet, I, I just separated each one by that. So the notes are, are separate here for each system. And um, what I did here for screenshots, I'll just scroll down here. You can see all the different kinds of data that's in here. Notice that, uh, for example, uh, for code, you can actually set it so it will color code it for you. Looks nice. If you're keeping a script in there or a record of one. Uh, screenshots, for example. And the cool thing about this program is it can be really large and have a lot of screenshots in it, and it's still fairly responsive. It doesn't get bogged down. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's well written, I think. It really is. It's called No Case Pro. And what was the other one that was on the. Oh, the coming back to that. It was Freemind? Yeah. Freemind, yeah. Freemind's the other one I like. Um, Freemind is a, as a mind manager or mind, 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 mapping. mind mapping, thank you. I was thinking about a commercial thing called Mind Manager Pro. Um, and that allows you to create mind maps that can be helpful. Uh, on smaller engagements, I'm doing like, I've got a script that converts in map output I wrote to a, a mind manager uh, map, or mind, free mind map. Uh, this is actually a, 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 just a tool map that I created uh, using uh, free mind. It's free, hence the name. <laughs> uh, 
And it's, it's a really cool tool. And it just, if you're doing, if you're doing sort of like, you know, brainstorming kind of stuff, it's really good to, to be able to use this just to create kind of a map. Um, in reports, though, for, cut, for clients, uh, bigger maps tend to not, they tend to not scale very well, you know, and um, I tried that once with like in-map results, having like the systems and then all the different, port, the different ports are open. But it got to be too big, so I stopped doing that. But it's really, it's kind of a cool tool. Um, and it's easy to uh, script things to put it into the format that it uses to uh, create the maps too, so that's, that's kind of useful. All right. So, you know, for every purchase of, uh, of uh, Notecase Pro that we sell, I make about 20%. No. No. Yeah, I check out the free version of that, see what you think of it. I, I like it a lot. I was using something called um, Notekeep or something like that for a while, and it was just so buggy, it was crash, and it's not good when you're trying to keep notes, you know, and you haven't saved it in a couple minutes, and, or a couple hours, <laughs> and it crashes. Not good. Uh, more data collection uh, tools and tips. Uh, screen captures. Now, you can use the print screen button on your keyboard. Uh, works pretty well, uh, or all print screen for the, just the individual window. Um, I like though being able to actually take a portion of the window and capturing it, not necessarily the whole window. Keep my report smaller and to focus in on what I want them to see. So I, for Linux, I use Shutter. I know there's a lot of tools for Windows out there to do screen captures, but I like Shutter for Linux. There's one called Scrot, which I think is a very unfortunate name for a tool. <laughs> Sorry, my daughters, I won't. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and Scrot is a command line uh, screen capture tool, which is, it, in a way, is kind of pointless because what you're going to get a screen capture of is you typing the word Scrot. To, to run it. Uh, but you can actually uh, create like a cron job and, and have it take screen captures once every you know, minute or whatever to kind of keep, keep track of what you're doing. Or, uh, there, there are uses for it. I haven't really used it much, but it's out there. There's also a cool tool that came out uh, not long ago. And it's based on two things. One is a in-map uh, script called HTTP screenshot, which is, based, which is also based on the WK HTML to image uh, uh, tool. What this does basically is it allows you to run an in-map scan, and for any systems running port 80 or 443 or whatever you designate, 8008 or whatever other HTML ports are open, it will screenshot the front page of the website for you as you scan. Uh, it's a little slow, um, and it doesn't work well with dynamic sites like Ajax and things that move around. Uh, on web pages, but it does an okay job. Also, web pages like in a subdirectory somewhere, and we can find that obviously. But it does do a fairly good job of just getting the first screen um, to give you an idea of what's running on the system. And it's automated, which is cool. So you can actually run this against the IP address range, and it will output a directory full of images uh, of the website running along with the IP addresses as well. So. <coughs> Oops. Wrong mouse button. Any questions? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, more like command line tools. You, you most have an output option. You want to use that if you're pen testing. Uh, I like, for example, you all know probably uh, in math the OA, which is what I use, which is the uh, output all formats, you know. And you, you follow OA with the name you want to give it. And usually I do like the IP address or something. Uh, not every tool you use on a command line where you want output not every tool do you get an option like that. So you have to do something else to do that. This actually works in Windows too. Uh, again, this is very rudimentary for a lot of people, but it's something a lot of people don't know about. Uh, you can actually pipe or redirect the output to a, to a text file. So if your tool doesn't have any kind of output option, use the greater than symbol to pump it out to a text file there and you have your output. So, anybody not know about that? That's really depressing for me. <laughs> no. I'm glad you all know about that, so. Pass that on to people who don't know about that, because they are out there. Okay, <laughs> reporting. <laughs> okay, you know where I got these, well, these missing. <laughs> that one I know. It didn't come from, it didn't originally come from there, but they used, they used that one too, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, reporting, um, we all hate to do it. Anybody like reporting? Griff, you would. You would like reporting. Um, 
he, we, 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 we're looking for someone to help with the budget for the conference. He's like, oh, I want to do it. I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, I want to be the accountant. Um, but in general, we don't like doing it. Um, it's the part of the pen test we don't like at the end that we have to sit at our desk and not do any actual pen testing, but sit there and write to try to be, you know, try to be wordy. Uh, we'd actually hire someone to do it for us if we could. We'd like a personal assistant to do that for you. Yeah, here's the results, write the report, you know. So um, we'd rather be the dentist, I think, than to do a uh, report. Uh, forming head picture things into strings of characters, not this simply. That was a joke, by the way. Not good with words. Anyway. Okay, I'll take that one out for next time. I'd say that's not a few. Um, so I mentioned earlier, keeping your data organized can make reporting much easier. If you're having to spend time digging for data through all of your, your results for the report, that can be a pain. Also, uh, write scripts to convert output, like for example, in-map stuff. I use in-map as a good example. Uh, to format easier to insert your document. So I've written a script actually that, that, that converts in-map outputs to like a really nice looking, more structured type of a format I can copy and paste into a document if I need to that, do that. Also, there's something called ASCII doc. Have you heard of that? I uh, actually heard it from first from Matt Tesoro. It's, a, it's basically a text doc document format that you can actually script, for example, maybe in-map output into this format, and it's translatable into directly into PDF. So you can take simply an in-map scan, use ASCII doc to convert it to a PDF, and that look right there is good enough for looking for the report itself, just copy and paste it at that point, or HTML if you want. And also, it's very important, report as you go. Now, does anybody actually do that, though? I mean, I, we try to, right? We try to report as we go, and we, we just don't want to deal with it. We don't want to, we're in the flow. We don't want to mess with reporting, but it's a good idea. It's a good idea if you can, if you've got your document open, to go ahead and start writing along. It's, it's also, it's fresh in your mind, right? Which it, it just, it, it's right there. Um, I often, because maybe it's an age thing, Let's go back to my Steve Buscemi picture. Um, I often forget sometimes what, how I did something. And I have to remember and dig through data and stuff. If I've just done it, at least get it, get, write it down somewhere in, in, a, in, a, in a crude format so you'll know and you can copy and paste it and then, and then make it look nice. You know what I'm saying? I mean, try to report as you go. None of us do it. We all preach it, we don't do it. Uh, don't overlook the easy. I'll leave this up for a second just so you can see what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he crawls over the fence and it's already open. Um, sometimes, sometimes grappling hooks aren't really needed. Now, I say this because um, I'm going to have to turn this off while I talk about it. I like that one too. Um, very often, we, 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 we approach a problem. I'll give, I'll give you an example. I was talking with a friend of mine about the word hacker. And he was all like, it's bad, you know, their hackers are bad, you don't watch the news, they're all, they're all doing bad things. I was explaining to him that the media tends to take the word hacker and run with it in directions that it never was meant to be taken. Anytime someone, someone guesses a password on someone's phone, it's a hacker, all right? If, you're, if your company gets, gets, gets breached, it's a hacker. No, no, if your company, it was a professional APT, Chinese, state-driven, whatever hacker, right? Because, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to have your company hacked by a 12-year-old kid in his basement. It sounds a lot better to say, yeah, it was this guy that they targeted us, and, you know, they usually go after the government. But no, no, it was our company, so, you know. Um, and I explained to him, you know, that's not really the case, though. That a lot of things, and I give this example. I said, okay, let's say you're a jewel thief, and you're walking along the road. And I'm sorry. You're not a jewel thief. You're a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> the difference here. <laughs> you're a 12-year-old kid. You walk on the road. You see this person's house. Their door is open. And there is a diamond necklace on the table and no one's watching so you walk in and grab it and the media reports jewel thieves raid the house of so-and-so well it was a 12 year old kid right it was easy to do but let's reverse that let's say you are a jewel thief and you have this museum that there's a diamond that the size of your fist and you're gonna steal it and you have your grappling hooks and you have your ropes and you have your suction cup climbing things and you have the little thing that you can cut holes in glass with like you know in the movies, and you've rehearsed how to somersault through the laser beams, right? You've got that down. 
And you get to the, you get the museum and you notice the door's open. Right? It's actually unlocked. And the guard is asleep at his desk. And you look through the, and you see, and the diamond's right there, they took it out for cleaning, it's on the desk, right there. As a professional jewel thief, are you going to, at that point, close the door, get your goblin hook out, because you rehearsed, it's the cool thing, it's the sexy thing, and you're gonna, you're gonna scale a building and then the suction cups and cut the hole, and are you gonna do that or are you just gonna walk and take the jewel? Which one are you, I'm asking you a question, which one are you gonna do? You're gonna take the jewel, why? It's easier. You're a jewel thief, but you're smart, right? I mean, you're gonna go the easy route. Well, the same is true with computers. Um, we want to think like this guy. Now, by the way, my, my at the time, five-year-old daughter, I, I commissioned her to create a picture of a, I called it a computer bad guy. So, it's a bad guy because he has a goatee, and his eyebrows are, are down. Because as she pointed out when she was five, if they were up, it'd be a computer sad guy. <laughs> Not a threat. The problem, though, is that we want to think like this guy, but we need to learn to think like these people, too. Right? Not just the, not just the, the guy who's the APT, who's the, who's the who's the professional hacker, but also the, 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 the random employee who's careless and, and stumbles upon things. The, but can be not the kid, but you never know if some kid's gonna hack into something accidentally. My daughter, my older daughter, when she was when she was about three years old, walked up to my computer with one hand, pounded the keyboard, the thing I was working on closed and five other things open. And I, to this day, I can't figure out what she did to create that. But my point is, is that we learned, need to learn to think on all these different levels, right? As as a pen tester, because if you just think about the, the higher attacks, and there's reason for that, because uh, okay, low-hanging fruit, first of all, default credentials, right? Now, this has happened to me more than once. I'm working with a team on a pen test, and I'm, 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 I'm writing these fuzzing scripts and things like that and getting ready to just, you know, I'm looking at the, at the versions of the FTP server and looking for, by the time I actually do my internet search, my teammate is already in because he tried admin, admin on the login and got in, right? Uh, bad passwords, uh, subset and clear text. Social engineering, very, very non-technical, you know, doesn't take a technical person to pull that off. Uh, dumpster diving, open wireless networks, a big one. So, which has a higher risk? Default passwords or, oh, this, here it is. Which one's higher? Default passwords, why? There's more of them. They're easier, right? Right? So, which finding is more valuable to a client? The one that's higher risk. Yeah. Now, find them both. Don't get me wrong, I mean, find them both. But don't overlook the easy stuff because that's how people are getting in. Um, I think I said that whole thing. But learn to think also like, like someone's grandmother, right? not just the, the highly skilled ad adversary. That's an important part. Now, this is a story I learned the hard way. I was asked by a client to do a pen test and they wanted this year, we did it every year for this client um, in the fall. And they don't exist anymore as a client. They're actually a company is gone, so I, I can talk about it a little more freely now. Um, they want a physical pen test. So, okay. Uh, their building was a four-story <laughs> office building that they occupied the second floor in. Every other, every other tenant in the building, uh, they, all, they were all given these, you know, cards to key in, right? Security cards. <coughs> and they turned the, the scanners off at 7 a.m. in the morning. So after 7 a.m. till about 8 p.m., there's no, you can just walk in. Now, you walk in the, the, the side stairwell up to the second floor where the client was, was to stay, staying, and you're in an office area suddenly where not only is there no other people sitting there, the offices are mostly empty, but the server room, which by the way was a converted office, and you can actually open the tiles up on the ceiling and look over into the server room. Um, I didn't crawl over though. That, I didn't want to hurt myself and break the tile, so I just took pictures. But um, it, the, the server room door was right there and it had this kind of lock on it. Now, you ever seen these locks? Surely you have. It's called a simplex lock. And I was studying it. And the way these work is that for the different five buttons, uh, you can push a combination in. But this, the, the catch is, is that each button can only be pushed one time in a combination. So you can't have a combination of one, one, two, three. You can have one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. But you can't push the button twice. You can also push two buttons at the same time. 
So you can have like the combination of one and three and then two, four, so on and so forth. And then you turn the handle and it'll reset it. And it'll let you in or you can try again. So um, this is the, was on the door. So what I did, I first calculated how many combinations there were for this, given that you can't push the same button twice. And with five buttons, I think there was about 120 possibilities, you know. I wanted to narrow that down a little bit because I figured I was going to go up there and I was going to basically go to the door and try what I knew and get in or not get in. So I took a dry erase marker and I put a little dot on each button. I came back the next day and all the buttons were wiped off except for one, the number one. So two, three, four, and five are part of the combination, but not one. 30, 32 possible combinations at this point, I think. It was like under 40. So I pull a chair up because nobody's around. Click, 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 click. And I try, and I think about the 12th time I was in. Open the door, take a picture inside. I'm like doing a little happy dance that we do, like it's pen testers, you know. And um, I report back and tell them about it, and they say, oh, that's terrible, you know. The next year I come back, the same client, and they've actually replaced us with a biometric lock. Cool, you know. And so this is where, this is where uh, my pride got knocked down to a lower level here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning against the door, looking at the biometric lock, or the key, and I notice that when I lean against the door, it opens a little bit. <laughs> I can see the latch. Take my credit card out, pop, I'm in. And so I have to explain to the client that this is something I didn't see the year before. I completely missed that the year before. I was so busy trying to crack the lock combination, they had a much more costly vulnerability on the door than that. I didn't see that. So, you know, they bought a piece of metal, covered it up for 50 bucks, and all was well. But, um, yeah, actually, I had a little momentary, you know, victory there, and then I thought, oh, gosh. I should have seen it the previous year, but actually they asked me that in the, in the meeting. Why didn't you see it the previous year? Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't there. <laughs> it was there. It was there. Okay, next uh, lesson here. Don't rush recon. All right, this is from uh, Daddy Daycare. Kid's gone to the bathroom inside, and the bathroom is looking at this mess he made. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this goes along the same thing about, about the easy stuff. Um, for things, for example, in recon, you learn, for example, email addresses, clues about what te kind of technology they're running. Uh, you can use a product, a, a tool called Cool. Have I used that before? It'll actually, it'll, it'll go through the web. You put it at a website of the client. And it will actually, it'll actually filter that website for keywords to use as passwords. So for example, you point it at um, NFL.com. You might get a bunch of NFL teams and football terminology that you can use as a password file. It's, it's kind of cool. <coughs> um, broken windows. Anybody heard of the concept of broken windows? It's kind of a cool concept if you haven't heard it. Uh, in New York, they had a problem with, uh, with um, uh, crime on subways, and so they, they, they decided to clean up the subways and take the graffiti off, and it took, to proved to the criminals who the owners were, you know, and changed the... You can tell a lot from a website by things like broken links, outdated styles, if they're using animated GIFs like I do, <laughs> and scrolling marquees. Um, then not only is their site out of date, maybe the security as well is out of date, right? So those are clues. Something called the inductive method uh, of observing. Uh, you uh, observe, observation is the most important part of this. You observe first, and then you interpret what you've observed, and then you apply a solution to that. That's called the inductive method. Um, but observation is really important, and the uh, recon phase is very important as well. I will go through this very quickly. Um, I, this, this is used a lot, I know, at, at conferences, the Pirates versus Ninja thing. Uh, and I'm not running out of time, so I need to kind of hurry here. Pirates are always an attack, they're very brutal, not terribly organized, rely on force more than tactics a lot of times, and they have a lot more fun though. Yeah. Right, I mean, think about it, just the fun part, who'd rather be a pirate or a ninja? Um, ninjas are more disciplined, surgical in their techniques, more organized, and they don't have as much fun, but can be more lethal, right? I mean, face it, ninja versus pirate, one-on-one, -on -one, probably not gonna be much of a fight. It, it, despite your, you know, the side you take on this argument, because I know it's a very passionate one. <laughs> uh, or maybe we're talking about art versus science. Uh, this is kind of a funny cartoon. Uh, I think it should be more, he's got, he's got this formula, and then he says, then a miracle occurs, and he's got the rest of the formula. I think you should be more explicit in your in step two. 
um, art versus science, um, the pen tester is an artist, thinks on his or her feet. They adapt methods to their environment. They can find new creative ways to exploit, but they can also miss things because of time spent on like chasing rabbit trails, for example. The reporting also is not so great. It's, it's, the, it's the art, artistic part of us that hates reporting, right? It's not the, it's not the uh, scientist part that hates reporting, it's the artistic part. The pen testing, as a scientist, covers all the areas of the framework. They're going through a framework and they're getting all the points in. Uh, they can be very meticulous. Reports are organized and logical, but doesn't do so well with the unpredictable, right? If it's off the script, if it's something not in the pen testing execution, ex execution standard, they might not do so well on it. Um, lots of mistakes, but not explicitly spelled out in their framework. So what do we do? We've got weaknesses and strengths. And here's an example. We have phases here of a pen test, recon, analysis, exploitation, post-exploitation, and re reporting. And you've got to get this at some point, right? <laughs> but, you know, the, the scientists will go through this step by step and report. Done. Where the, art, the artistic part, the pirate part of you comes in, is that you're able at any point to go back and say, OK, we found things in here. Let's go back and analyze. Let's go back and recon based on this. Let's go back and look at, you know, in other words, it's no longer a linear thing. It's more of just a kind of a more fluid. Uh, I've even seen it as a circle, which I don't think is quite accurate either. But um, you, you're, you're thinking on your feet a little more. You're being a little more creative, right? You're not sticking to this. But, but then you're getting back to it again, though. That's the important thing. You're leaving it when you need to, and then you're getting back and finishing out the framework. Make sense? All right. So all of us are, you know, like I said, it's often the, the um, we want to be more of the pirate, I think. We want to be more of the, you might see the movie, uh, 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 what is it called? Swordfish, the really bad movie about, yeah. yeah. And the scene where he's hacking and he's got the glass of wine and he's clapping and you know, looking at the screen. And, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what it has to do with this, but it really annoyed, annoys me. <laughs> no, it's like the artistic part, you know. It's like the, the fun um, uh, close your eyes and type, type on the keyboard kind of thing, and it's ridiculous. You need the science in there as well. Uh, let's see, this, this is kind of re recap here what I just said. Um, don't focus heavily on the bullet points. You might see something unusual, but if you're all over the place, then you might miss some things. Uh, stick to your framework and venture off when you need to, but then return to it. And, and make sure you cover all the points in the framework. Anybody ever heard of the PTS, the PTS framework, the uh, standard? Yeah, it's a really good standard to work with, actually. I, I don't think it's complete. I think it's a little bit weak in the application security part, but, um, but uh, it's actually a very, very, probably the best one out there right now, I think. OK, uh, another point, protect your customer's data. Uh, types of data we collect for our, from customers are in-map scans, password hashes, screenshots, photos, network diagrams, evidence files. How many of this is considered to be sensitive data? How much of this? All of it? Yeah. What happens if you have a thumb drive and you're keeping it on that and you lose it in the parking lot or drop it somewhere? Yeah, I mean, even if they never get, it may never get used, but it's, it's a huge violation of, of just that trust between you and the, and the client, and that's never good. Is that right? Hey, oh, yeah, and the NDA as well. Yeah, you've agreed to. Um, client data should never exist on your system unencrypted. Uh, Client contamination, for example, you can often be do, doing two different, this happened to me once. I was doing a pen test for a client. I gave them the final report, and they asked me, what's this IP address? I don't recognize this, it's host name. It's from a previous client. <laughs> I used the report as a format, as a, as a, as a have you ever did it before? Use the previous report as a template, and you didn't scrub it properly? Yeah, so that was embarrassing. Uh, lawsuits, perhaps, and lots of reputation for your company. Uh, BP oil spill, there was an incident there where an insurance adjuster who was, who was visiting all of the victims of the BP, BP oil spill, um, lost his laptop. And uh, I love this because the company came out and said, we want everybody to know about this laptop that you shouldn't worry about it because we have the, op we have the we, this is what they said, we have the ability to remotely turn off that and disable that system. What does that tell you about the encryption on that system? Think about that. All they said was we have the ability to, to remotely disable the system. It's not encrypted. Why? Would they mention that if it was encrypted? Yeah. <laughs> What's this junk about remotely disable? I mean, you know. Exactly, exactly. So, and nobody knows what happened to it. There's probably 50,000 records on there of people, you know, it's bad. Um, tools, of course, you have things like TrueCrypt. No Case Pro, which I mentioned earlier, has an encryption option, as a matter of fact. You can save an encrypted format as well. Um, TrueCrypt, there's others out there as well. There's some Linux 
um, I like TrueCrypt because it's cross-platform. And if you need to give a file to a customer, you can actually put TrueCrypt as an executable on a drive along with the file you've encrypted, and they can use that. They, you can actually run TrueCrypt, um, what do you call it? Help me out here. Without installing it, you can run it as a single file. It's called, yeah, okay, that's good enough. Portable, thank you, portable, thank you. Uh, let's see. Create encrypted volumes to keep all client data in the volume. Encrypt USB drives, of course. Uh, use an engagement. Uh, use only secure as means possible to communication. PGP lockify, uh, et cetera. Avoid using file sharing services such as Dropbox, which, by the way, they don't have a good reputation for security. Um, I like how they changed. They had an incident a couple years ago, and the, and the website language in Dropbox. And I use them for different things, but the language went from saying, we are unable to, to look at your files because they're encrypted. Our employees are unable. They changed that to say, our employees are not allowed to look at your files. <laughs> Little difference in wording there, you know, between ability and, yeah, don't do that, slap your hand. So, um, and set an example, I mean, you're a security professional, right? I mean, if you're running around unencrypted stuff and you're, and you're, you're lecturing your client, oh, we found this unencrypted on your, on, your, on your network and blah, 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 you lose your drive and it's unencrypted, that's, that's not a good example. Okay, real quick, pen testers, uh, disaster recovery and backup, disaster recovery and business continuity planning, sorry. <laughs> uh, system issues are often not taking a serious threat, lots of important data, putting that of the client is a big risk. Being able to continue an engagement as quickly as possible following some kind of system failure is critical. Uh, if you're remote somewhere and your, your hard drive fails, what do you do? Well, you can have your company drop ship you another system, maybe the client has one, I think it's really bad for them to ask your client for something to use. I really do. Um, that means even if they're nice, we'll do it for you. So are we doing on time? Somebody needs to go. Okay. So uh, you want to be able to, to, to pick up that, that problem as quickly as possible and move on. I'm almost done here, by the way. Always, always, always. Yes? What do you, what do you use the pen tester? Do you take it back to the system? Do you do the drop ship? Actually, yeah. I'm just <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, a second system would be great, actually. Uh, it's just a lot to bring with you, you know. And I don't do a lot of remote anymore. I'm doing it all in-house, but right now. But always bring a, a, some kind of live bootable CD, a Kali disk or uh, uh, the uh, WTE CD. Uh, because even if your hard drive crashes, you can still boot up that CD and, and run that CD and still work in that. Have your data and stuff backed up on an encrypted drive so that you're, you don't lose your scripts if your drive fails. You want to have some backups and stuff. Or if possible, uh, a remote server via UP, uh, VPN, I almost said UPN, VPN. Um, that might not be possible on a remote site because you might not be able to connect to the VPN depending on the client's network. But uh, that's probably the best solution is have it remotely stored somewhere safe and uh, over an encrypted uh, transmission method. A backup system is preferable but needs to be maintained. Clone hard drive or rated uh, laptop is also a good idea as well. Uh, it's a little more work involved and you have to clone it. And then if you update it, you gotta clone it again. Keep it uh, the same. Uh, script tips. Script tips, I like that. Uh, learn at least one scripting language. Every pen testing class I've ever been to, they, they, they tell people that. You know, figure out what you want to use as a, as a scripting language and learn it and get good at it. Uh, Ruby, Python, Perl, etc. I'm still on the fence between Ruby and Python. How many people put Python? Raise your hand. How many people put Ruby? Ruby Perl? Perl. No, a lot of people don't care. Perl? <laughs> Pearl? How many people prefer Perl? Okay. <laughs> you guys need to, you know, decide because it's an important issue. You can't sit on the fence, guys. Come on. I need help, you know, so I won't be fence riding anymore. I'm leaning toward Python, but I like, I like Ruby a lot. But, you know, knowing a scripting language is very, very important. Our attitudes as pen testers. Very important. Um, when, you're, <laughs> when you're on a client side and you find something really bad, don't do your happy dance in front of them. That's bad form. You're, you're telling someone their baby's ugly and you're going, yes! Not good. Um, find a private place to do it later, you know? But they want a sympathetic ear. They want to know somebody's there. They're, you're there to help them, right? You're not there to just completely trash on them. You're there to help them out. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't be cocky and, you know, and laugh at them while they're, while they're, you're, they're reading your report. <laughs> Okay, oh, that's, that's a lot, actually, what? oh, why did I have that in there? I somehow managed to copy my original slide in there. 
Okay, um, final thought. Security isn't everything. Uh, find, this is also prevent burnout. Find a hobby that's not computer related, right? Find something to do that's not in front of your screen. And I told this to somebody, one of the, hat, the, the, the guys at the lockpick village, and they said, yeah, we do lockpicking. I'm like, that's kind of cheating, actually. I didn't think about that one. But find something else to do, you'll get burned out. And also get involved with the community here in Austin or wherever you're located. There's lots of things you can get, get, that you can do, get involved in. Um, you want to network of people, basically. You don't want to be by yourself. You want to find people you can work with and learn from uh, and network with, especially if you lose your job. That's really good to have a network, believe me. So, all right, any questions real quick? Yes, sir. Um, when you come to, it sounds like you go to the client side a lot to do the testing. I, I did more before. I now, I'm, I'm, I'm working for GM, so I'm kind of doing everything in-house now. But yeah, I did do, I, most of my work I did remotely. Uh, we did internal testing at Pine Science. A lot of times we just, they give us a little room to work in. So did you deal, did you have to deal with the fact some of them insist on you sitting at their supply terminal to do all the testing? Or? I've never had that. The, the, the worst, I mean, they, they give me a room to work with, and sometimes the room's not ideal, but they always let me bring my system in. And because they know I have my tools in my system, and they, they've always allowed me to do that. I've never come across. That's not like government place, you know, that could be different. I never did much federal, or, or uh, most of my stuff was private sector stuff, so. But uh, yeah, that, I can see where I can make a problem. Because um, you're limited to what they have, you know. Yeah. Changes the amount of time. Yep. Results. Sure does. But you got, you got, that's where the whole pirate thing comes. You got to be creative and figure out how to deal with that when that happens. So, yes? Um, what's clear text? Clear text. Where'd you see that? You mentioned it earlier. Okay, sorry. It's unencrypted text. Yeah, sex is in clear. Yes, Rebecca. <laughs> What's been testing? Let's talk after. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk after. All right. Uh, thank you. You've been a very, uh, very uh, good audience, and uh, I, I had fewer hecklers this time, which is great. So appreciate it, and uh, have, have a good conference. <coughs>